Good morning. Uh, welcome back to Bible study on Revelation. This is chapter 16, um, continuing in our series. If you are looking for the rest of that series, uh, you can click uh, the playlist that this is part of on YouTube, and you can find all the other videos that I have released for that. Um, and to get updates as both this study and uh, daily devotions and other Bible studies and worship, if you want updates when all of those go live, go ahead and click subscribe. Um, right below this video, you click the little subscribe button and it'll make sure that St. Paul is always top of your YouTube feed. Um, that is beside the point. I am not here to advertise YouTube though. I am here to go into Revelation with you, get some uh, clarity, hopefully get some application to our lives, and uh, hopefully spark some discussion in the comments down below. So, without further ado, here is Revelation 16. Um, so to recap where we're coming from, if you look at Revelation 15, which we looked at last week, it's the third, it's preparing John for the third and final vision of the end of the world. Um, the first vision, the first set of seven, we have these three sets of seven. The first one, there were seven seals on the scroll that contained God's plan for salvation. And as each scroll was un, or as each seal was undone, um, there were different disasters that happened. Uh, and then the second set of seven was seven trumpets. And when angels sounded each of those trumpets, again, there were seven plagues or disasters, however you want to put it. Now we're getting into it. The, the last chapter introduced seven angels that have seven plagues. And if you'll recall, these, uh, these plagues have... It's all preparing for God's ultimate victory and judgment. Um, so introducing this chapter, we're going to get into each of those plagues. Um, we're going to get all of the plagues in just one chapter, which is a, a bit of a, a difference from previous uh, sets of seven where they split them up. Um, these are pretty quick and to the point. Uh, what we're going to look for is... Among other things, we're going to see connections to previous cycles of seven. So we're going to see that some of these plagues overlap with previous plagues, but they're more severe. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So with that introducing the chapter, let's move into the text itself. Um, I do, as always, encourage you have your own Bible in front of you, whether that be a physical book or um, on your cell phone, because it is a lot easier to follow along with my crazy train of thought if you can actually look at the text and see what I'm talking about, um, since I don't have it sitting up behind me the entire time. So we have Revelation 16, verses 1 through 4. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of God's wrath. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was on the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And despite my misleading enunciation of that reading, um, that is verse four, and we're gonna we're gonna stop there and talk about this a little bit. So, to begin, there's there's someone speaking from the temple. Now, the assumption here is that it is God, because it is it is God's temple. He reigns from there. He rules from there. So. It makes a lot of sense that it would be him, especially because God is the one who commands angels. So we're going to operate as if it's God. There are, if you look out in, in the world, there are suggestions um, that it could be someone else. Uh, it could be a, a more powerful angel, which to me just 
communicates that God said it just further down the line because that more powerful angel would still take his orders from God. Um, so that's that's the speaker we have before us, is which is a good reminder that all these disasters, they are by the will of God and at his command. Um, which brings up a whole separate discussion about uh, why would God use disasters and and <laughs> that kind of stuff? And if if that discussion interests you, I would go to go again to St. Paul's YouTube page and look for the playlist called Real Life Real Gospel. It's a podcast we put out every week. And the one from last week was titled Real Suffering Real Gospel. And it takes a pretty honest look at suffering and God causing suffering and disasters and stuff like that. So, um, that's a tangent. Go listen to the podcast if you're interested. Um, anyway, so we have God speaking from a temple and these these bowls of wrath being poured out. And each of these bowls of wrath have a plague um, associated with them. And in a lot of these, there's some similarity similarity to the plagues of Egypt that God used uh, to free his people from Pharaoh. Which is a really cool connection because there, Jesus in his ministry a couple times and then throughout the Old Testament we get this connection of the Exodus of God freeing his people from slavery in Egypt, to there's this connection drawn to God then freeing his people from slavery to sin and death and the devil. So there's a really cool connection there, especially once you get into the Passover and the Passover lamb that is Christ. Um, so it's really cool to see this is, kind of, this is God's final victory where he is freeing us, his people, from sin, death, and the devil. And we see these connections to the same plagues he used in the Old Testament. Um, so, in addition to that, some of these are intensified versions, like I mentioned before, of previous plagues, of the previous versions of the plagues in these different cycles of vision that John is seeing. Um, and what these are, at their core, it's a final warning to people about the seriousness of his judgment. He's doing these things and giving people one last turn to repent before it's too late. Um, and the the best, I guess, analog that I can give you is, uh, I guess, a parent. If, if you take a parent and they are warning a kid not to do something, the, the first warning might be, just, hey, stop doing that. Um, the second warning might be, like, stop using a toy that way. The second warning might be, go in timeout for a couple minutes. And it gets further and further until finally, each time you say, if you keep doing this, I'm going to take the toy away and you're not going to get it back. So this is the final step before taking the toy away and you never get it back. And that's not a perfect metaphor. I kind of thought of that on the fly. Um, so, obviously, not perfect. But I, I would assume you, you get the idea of these warnings, these punishments leading up to the ultimate punishment are getting worse and worse and worse with the hope that people would turn to God. So that's what we see. And then we go into these plays. And the first one we see is harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Now, if you recall earlier in Revelation, um, the beast is a, is a direct servant of Satan. And the beast is typically thought of as metaphorically referring to the political, the social, the economic powers that be in our world. So what this is saying, the mark of the beast are those who are 
worshiping the beast and by extension worshiping the devil this is idolatry and these these sores can be both connected to Egypt um, but very similar language is al also used in Job when it's talking about the sores that he is afflicted with so you have that going on and what these sores are described as is they're painful they're incredibly painful they're ugly they're a constant menace and suffering um, it's not a sore that like you get it and if you don't think about it it's not as bad it's it's bad enough that it is constantly on your mind um, so this is this is some real suffering for the people who who worship the image of the beast who are lifting their praises up to idols instead of to God so that's what we have here in the first plague and then the second plague is the sea becoming like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea now again these are there are a couple similarities here the first similarity of course being to the Nile one of the earliest plagues of Egypt was the Nile becoming like blood and the problems with that are, are pretty obvious I mean if water is blood as it says here, everything that's living in the water is going to die. And all of the resultant ecosystems and food chains and food webs that rely on those things in the ocean are going to suffer and eventually die through lack of sustenance. So there's... This is starting with it's making food harder to get. And then it moves forward. Uh, well, before I move forward, I just glanced at my notes. This is also a worse version of one of the previous uh, cycles. One of the trumpets, a third of the sea, all the living creatures are, are struck. Um, this is an intensified version. This is saying the whole sea, nothing, and, and it is more referring to like saltwater oceans, that kind of thing um all of it is going to be struck all the living creatures in the oceans are going to perish um and the reason i specify that it's kind of the salt water sea is because of this third plague which is pouring his the bowl out into the rivers and springs of water and they became like blood and uh the distinction here is the first one is affecting sea marine life this is potable water. So at this point, all of the water on Earth is turned to blood. No, Nothing is fit to drink. Water is unfit to drink, and as a result, life becomes impossible. So in, in the second plague, there's this reality that food becomes more and more scarce, and then you have potable water becoming more and more scarce. Um, and all this is making life much more difficult. And that's what we have just in these first three plagues. And with that, we are going to move into the next four verses of Revelation. Next three verses of Revelation. Revelation 5, or Revelation 16, 5 through 7. So we have, And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you have brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So as we go through this text, we have the angel of the waters. And again, this goes back to an ancient tradition that... Um, Angels were put in charge of various elements of creation to take care of them, to guide them, to whatever God wants to do with them, to do with that. And we have this angel of the water whose domain is being plagued. He has been given the waters to, be, to take care of, to be a steward of by God. And all of the water is being turned to blood. And all of its previous uses and functionality has been destroyed. And yet he's not upset, he's not angry, he's not asking God, why have you done these things to the waters? He says, 
you are just. This is right that you should be doing these things. And he's acknowledging the, the truth of God's justice. And then we go forward and we see uh, the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And we're speaking here of those who are under the altar. The saints who have been martyred, which is a reference to previously in the book of Revelation, we have the saints who have been martyred are asking God, how long until you take vengeance for us? And this is him taking vengeance for them. What I think is important to note here, though, is that nothing in this prevents repentance. Nothing in this outlaws repentance being taken care of, being happening. In, in the midst of these people who are suffering. So uh, even in the midst of this terror, there is still hope of repentance. But what I, I want to draw out for you and me as we look at this is, is both the angel and the saints under the altar, they don't question this judgment at all. They just say, true and just are your judgments. You are right to do these things. So my question is, for us, what does it look like to trust God's judgment? What is the practicality of that? And that's kind of an open-ended, vague question. But that's intentional. And I want to see how you take it and how, what does it look like in your life to trust God's judgment. So go ahead and comment in the discussions below. Pause the video. Take a second to do that. And then we'll resume. And as we resume, we go to Revelation 16, 8 through 11. Which says, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. So we have the fourth plague here, and that is, it's kind of the opposite of the plague of darkness, which is what we see in Egypt. We see a plague of darkness, and here we, we see the sun being intensified. But it's still a disruption of cosmic order. It's just instead of the sun being blotted out, the sun is being intensified. What is key here is it's not death causing, it's just pain without relief. Which I think is really, it's something maybe we can understand a little bit, especially those of you who are watching locally, who live in Florida. I'm sure at some point you've experienced a really bad sunburn. Uh, a bit of a, I guess a funny story. It wasn't so fun for me, but uh, my wife and I, we went on our honeymoon in Naples. And I think it was our first day out, we spent six to eight hours on the beach. We did reapply sunscreen, but apparently I did not reapply very well because I got torched. I was, I was bad. I was so badly burned, um, that it, it was one of those burns where it hurts to move any part of your skin. So I then spent the next probably two days not moving, which was fun but so when it talks about the sun being more intense and scorching everyone on earth, that has got to be excruciating. And what is interesting here is that they don't repent of their deeds. They just curse God, which boggles my mind because if, if you're cursing God, you're accepting his existence, but you're still not turning to him. You're still not putting your faith in him and trust in him. There's still no repentance. So my question for you, because I really can't wrap my head around this, what does it look like to curse God and still not put faith in him? That's a discussion question below. Uh, pause the video, interact with it. And as we come back, we get to the fifth plague where the object of their worship is now struck. This beast, the throne of the beast that is all idolatry and, and all those gods that people set up that aren't God. They, they strike the beast and his entire kingdom is, is gone, gone into darkness. And this is still a warning to stop worshipping the beast. 
It's saying this this false god that you have, he has no power. See, he is struck. His kingdom is struck with darkness. And still they refuse to repent. And we say, you know, how does that happen? How can that possibly be the case? And I don't know. Like, again, that's a question for below. Um, so, anyway, we're going to continue to Revelation 16, verses 12 through 16, which gives us the sixth plague, where the sixth angel, angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water dried up, to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad for the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of god the almighty behold i am coming like a thief blessed is the one who stays awake keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be exposed they assembled them at the place that in hebrew is called armageddon uh, before I go forward, I do want to apologize because uh, throughout this video I have been sniffing. I have allergies and they're kicking my butt this morning, so my apologies about that. Anyway, on to the sixth plague. There is a parallel here to the sixth trumpet angel in that this is discussing that last battle between the people of God, the church of God, and evil. And the forces of the devil and the beast and the false prophet. So, it talks about the Euphrates being dried up to make way for the kings from the east. Um, this is God preparing to make an end to all opposition. Historically, Israel comes from the east. Christ is prophesied to come from the east. God's people, symbolically, are coming from the east. So, this is God putting forward his army, sending his people forward against the armies of the devil. And then we have the dragon, which is Satan. The beast, which is the, the powers of the world, the idols of the world, and the false prophet who is within the church but pointing people toward the beast, toward Satan, which we've talked about in past studies about how that happens. Um, and they're releasing these, these frogs, these demonic spirits, to lead the kings of the earth. These symbolically are powers of the earth. Frogs are, and you may ask, well, why frogs? Frogs, traditionally, in in the Old Testament, are unclean animals. Um, still not my idea of something I want for dinner, but that's beside the point. And this is also, it's a reminder of the plagues of Egypt. The frogs were one of the plagues of Egypt, so frogs make an appearance here. Um, and that's the army. Those spirits then lead the kings of the world... The, the evil kings, the pagan nations against God's people. And then we get this kind of weird uh, step in in verse 15 where it's the voice of Christ saying, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake keeping his garments on that he might may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And at first that's like, it's kind of a weird, why would you say that at that point? But what this is is... It's a reminder of Christ's promise that he is going to come and save and support his people and his church. And this support is unexpected. So as, as these armies are gathering and maybe there's some intimidation and some fear at all of the forces of evil arrayed against God's people, there's a reminder that Christ is coming. Be prepared for him to come in support and salvation. Don't despair. <coughs> and I think this is something we struggle with. And this is something I can admit to you, I, I don't necessarily expect for Jesus to come tomorrow. And I think that if we're being honest with ourselves, most of us watching this video, most of us in this world, we aren't expecting Jesus to come tomorrow or later today. But we're called to be ready for him to come at any given point. For right now, for tomorrow, for next week. At any point, we're supposed to be ready. So my reflective question for you is how can we change that mindset to kind of always be ready for Jesus to come back? And how can we keep this in mind? How can we remind ourselves of that 
And this is a reflective question because it's a little bit personal. How can you remind yourself to keep this in mind? So there is not a discussion for that below because it is a reflective question. It's just for you. Um, and then this section closes. They assembled them at the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. So this is actually a, a reference to a place in the Old Testament. Um, it comes from Mageddon. And it was a place that was one of the few places in the area where logistically large armies could gather, where there was a, a availability of resources, of water, of food, and space for large conflicts to take place. That's probably not what this is talking about. This is probably not talking about the historical place. It is a metaphor for a war that is going to consume the planet, a large scale, scale conflict keeping always in mind that the enemy will not prevail. Um, and that's where we close in verse 16. And then we're going to go to verse 17 through 21, which is the seventh angel, which says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and the great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of hail because the plague was so severe. So here we have the voice of God speaking again. We have them saying, it is done. It is finished. The voice of God speaks. This is the end itself. And the air itself is struck. Which obviously prevents breathing. Um, what the air getting struck looks like, we don't know. But it's there. So, we stick with it. Um, and then we see... Uh, this is essentially, this is coming to the end of God's merciful patience. This is a time for judgment. Um, and we see the, the lightning, the peals of thunder, the great earthquake. And this is re reminiscent. It reminds us of God's appearances on Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. This is God's final reckoning of the human race. The pagan nations are falling, and that's what we see, the great city split into three parts, the cities of the nations falling. This is all before God's judgment. And then Babylon is singled out. And this is not a literal Babylon, whether the city or the people. This is uh, symbolic, because Babylon at this point is a type. It is a placeholder for political and economic and social orders, pagan philosophies, anything that is not of God is being totally destroyed and falling into ruin. And at this point, there, there's not much chance left to turn. We are approaching this final judgment. And then we see creation beginning to be transformed. Islands flee away. The mountains are, are flattened. Um, creation is being radically, violently, and, and completely transformed before God. We're seeing the beginning of the new creation where God is transforming the world into what it should be. And yet, and there's this plague, plague of hail, but people again, they curse God. There is, there is no repentance. They're, they're clinging to the beast's hatred of God, even in the face of hell. Even when the, the conclusion of their path is completely evident, they cling to, to the beast's hatred of hell. And, or the, the beast's hatred of God, sorry. Um, and that's where Revelation 16 closes. And it's kind of a dark place to close, but what I want to remind you is that Revelation is all about God. It is all about God's plan for salvation for his people and condemnation of those who are outside of him. So, um, that's what we have. That's Revelation 16. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, please put them below. I, I do check. I will reply to the best of my ability, even if that is saying, I don't know. Um, so if you have questions, please put them below. And with that, brothers and sisters, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.